let him put the mosquito larvae in your pool. Really? <laughs> Kudos to you. Let's give a round of applause for all the parents of our young scientists. <laughs> While we get set up for our, our next presentation, uh, for those of you that are watching uh, the live webcast, I wanted to point out a resource because there are, are students out there who are watching right now saying, how do I get to be there? How do I get to spend three days at 3M next year, right? So there's a great site, the award-winning site, actually. It's the Science of Everyday Life, and you're seeing kind of a little interactive here. It's a resource for parents, for teachers, for students, for families, to really start to see the science all around us. So there are virtual labs. There is my, my favorite, the Innovation Exploration. So you see all of these kind of things that we have in our lives, from our TVs to things in the kitchen, and the science that goes, that goes into making them, right? So for the teachers who are watching, we definitely encourage you to check out scienceofeverydaylife.com. Uh, it's a great way to inspire the students you're working with today so that they can be here next year or in years to come. So virtual labs and the travel through time, just a, an absolutely fantastic resource. So why don't, we, uh, why don't we get started with our second Young Scientist finalist for, for 2014. Uh, they are setting up right now. David did a great job of, of kicking it off. Uh, for those of you that are watching on the webcast, remember, uh, send us your pictures of you watching at DE3MYSC. So, are you ready, my friend? You're really ready? All right. So, this is Sahil. Uh, he is uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we were talking yesterday about our beloved Steelers. Uh, this is going to go much better. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so ready to roll? Yeah, I'm ready to roll. All right, let's give a round of applause for Sahil. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sahil Doshi, and I develop PolyCell. So the inspiration for PolyCell came about when I figured out that 1.2 billion people across the world, which accounts for 15% of the world's population, lack access to electricity. And carbon dioxide levels have reached a new level of 400 parts per million, which is almost toxic to human health. So I decided to make an innovation that would target these two problems. So I researched different ways to generate energy, and I decided to develop an energy source that would use carbon dioxide to generate electricity. Specifically, I decided to use a battery. So I hypothesized that if I created the battery that uses carbon dioxide and waste materials, I could generate up to 1.5 volts of electricity and 2 million of current. So before we get ahead of ourselves, um, let's go over some battery basics. Ohm's law is voltage equals the current multiplied by the resistance, and batteries usually consist of four components. There's an anode, which is aluminum in my cell, a cathode, which is the silver in my cell, electrolyte, which is a mixture of sodium chloride and carbonic acid in my cell, and a salt bridge. So my overall design goals were to make my battery eco-friendly but also effective, and the way I wanted to do this was by using carbon dioxide, making my battery easy to make and small and compact in size, and by minimizing costs by using waste materials. So my first order of business was to decrease the cell size because, as you can see, my cell occupied a lot of space but did not produce ample voltage. And the way I did this was by changing my salt bridge from a saturated towel salt bridge to a 3M mountain putty salt, tried and gum salt bridge. So the tried and gum salt bridge, believe it or not, uh, provided a conductive membrane for the salt bridge, while the mountain putty provided some structural support for the salt bridge. At this stage, I was able to increase voltage and current because of my change of salt bridge. So then I decided to use a voltaic pile. And a voltaic pile is basically just an electrochemical structure where you have multiple electrochemical cells stacked one on top of another. And this is designed to increase the conductivity and voltage of the battery. And at this point, my uh, voltage and current took off. It doubled the length of my battery. And then I decided to target the ionic conductivity of my cell. And ionic conductivity is the electrolyte's ability to conduct electricity depending on ion mobility and ion concentration. And so in order to calculate ionic conductivity, you first take the separator thickness of the salt bridge, and you divide it by the product of the cross-sectional area of the battery and the resistance of the battery. So my train of thought was to, take, to increase the ionic conductivity by first increasing the ion concentration and mobility. And I would do this by creating more sodium and chlorine ions by adding ammonia to dissolve more sodium chloride and to decrease separator thickness yet retain ion in the aqueous solution by using the 3M scotch bridge sponge. So the 3M scotch bridge sponge was used as a salt bridge in my battery and it was optimal for ion preservation in the aqueous solution. And I divided the layers into three millimeters so that it was 
in and up, and but the problem was my battery still wasn't able to increase in current. So I decided to pursue a thinner material with 3M scouring pack. And instead of using three millimeter layers, I used 1.5 millimeter layers. And as you can see, I use a net-like structure for the scouring pack. And the reason this is so is to allow the movement of all the ions across the entire salt layer. So then I decided to study the acid dissociation constant of carbonic acid. An acid dissociation constant is basically the strength of an acid depending on how many ions it can produce in solution. And I found out that carbonic acid has two dissociation constants. It can dissociate into bicarbonate and carbonate ions. And this is significant to me because if I could produce ample amounts of bicarbonate and carbonate ions, I could increase the ionic conductivity. So the final chemi chemical equations for my battery are that the aluminum anode lost electrons to the silver cathode. And in the electrolyte, the carbonic acid reacted with the ammonium hydroxide to produce ammonium bicarbonate and water. And the aluminum and the carbonate ions in the solution reacted to form aluminum carbonate. So I decided to compare my battery to other existing batteries out in the market. And I found that it was actually somewhat comparable because even, even though I used waste materials, uh, I compared my battery to batteries such as nickel cadmium and zinc carbide. At this stage, I was able to determine that my battery did fulfill its hypothesis of generating 1.5 volts. And it even surpassed 2 milliamp current level by generating 7 milliamp and 10 milliamp. So to even further enhance my battery, I would apply a pressure of 10 atmospheres to increase the solubility of carbon dioxide in the solution. And by doing this, I would increase the concentration of carbonate and bicarbonate ions and increase the ionic conductivity. So the implications for my battery are to use it in developing countries as a cheap alternative for energy to help the 1.2 billion people affected, um, to use it in a household as an inexpensive replacement for AA batteries or triple A. But I really see the use in industrial settings that emit a lot of carbon dioxide because if I could create some sort of device that constantly captures the carbon dioxide and generates electricity, that could be revolutionary. So, Very nice job, Sahil. Um, moving forward, let's say you want to make this practical on a large scale. What would be, again, some of the key variables that you would study, and how would you go about optimizing this to make this fully practical? Okay, so in order to optimize my battery to the fullest potential, I would have to probably figure out a way to capture and trap the carbon dioxide, because that is really the key for my battery's operation. And so that's why on my next slide, I was going to point out that I was thinking about mimicking biological components such as stomata and plants to actually trap carbon dioxide. And to even make it more accessible, instead of applying a pressure of 10 atmospheres, I would try to alter another variable such as temperature. Like to make it, so if I make the um, solution cooler, I could dissolve more carbon dioxide. So that's how I would optimize it and make it more practical for the industrial setting as well. you encounter as you develop your project? Um, the biggest challenge is probably controlling carbon dioxide because e even if you look at a soda can, the moment that you pop it open, all the carbon dioxide escapes. So in order to trap it, I actually use a soda stream machine and I pumped carbon dioxide into however much carbon dioxide I wanted to. And that was probably the most helpful thing in the world because I was able not only to trap and get more carbon dioxide, but I was also able to retain more carbon dioxide because it was an enclosed bottle. So to answer your question, the most challenging aspect is just implementing the carbon dioxide into my battery. Thank you. Let me read the seal cool design. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned cost-effective ratio yes. in your research. Did you compare that to existing alternative forms of energy technologies such as solar, uh, hydro, natural gas, and so forth? No, I didn't compare mine to other existing um, energy technologies, but I compared it to existing batteries. Um, currently, if I were to produce my battery at a large scale, my battery would actually be cheaper than an alkaline battery or a zinc carbon battery. And I think that's significant because um, not only am I reducing the cost, but I'm also creating an eco-friendly battery, something that neither the alkaline battery or zinc carbon battery does as well as my battery. And by using recycled materials, I think that my battery is probably, if I improved it to a higher level, would be the most effective electrochemical cell. Obviously, there are other forms of energy technologies, but I have yet to explore those. Thank you. 
Very nice, uh, Sahil, I, I enjoyed your presentation, thank you. Um, what other modifications might you make in considering the local resources of, of any given uh, nation? Okay, so I, I realized that um, ammonia is not an easily accessible uh, resource in developing countries, so I would try to use a very easily accessible solution, something even, even as simple as water, um, something even as simple as an acid rain that may be lacking in developing countries, um, uh, something that, just a solution that is, also, is easily, not only easily accessible in developing countries, but can produce the most effective results in my diet. So that's where I would go in addressing that. Sahil, in your findings, you mentioned that you had several resources that you uh, examined or looked at. Uh, my question is, when you look at capturing carbon dioxide versus developed countries versus undeveloped countries, how would that play into the role of this particular battery in the fact that your end product is to generate electricity? So what do you mean by resources? I'm sorry. So I think you mentioned, if I'm correct, that you had done some research on as far as the processes that were involved with your uh, generation of electricity from um, the carbon dioxide. Yes, yes. So um, for a comparison between developed and undeveloped countries, I would say the biggest difference between the two would be that the lack of technology in developing countries, which is something I, w I was planning to address with that question that she addressed, is that I would try to find, for more developing countries, I would try to find more easily accessible materials. Um, I would also try to just um, create a technology that would capture carbon dioxide, but would also do it in a cost-effective manner. Um, I understand that these like are very stringent uh, guidelines, but these are the things that I've addressed when comparing developed and undeveloped countries. You did a great job. That was fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic job.